<laughs> winded, but just hit the point. You ready? So we left off last week in the book of Joshua as we're crossing over into the place of our inheritance. Say with me, crossing over into the place of my inheritance. And what I mean by that, I'm, I'm beginning to understand that God has assigned me in the earth realm a, a specific sphere of influence. And when we hit that place of influence, when we hit that, that territory or that land that represents that that God has promised to us, he wants us to approach it a little bit differently, okay? So the first thing that I wanna talk about today are just rehearse as we moving on in Joshua chapter four, you've got to have some memorials along the way. I believe that you should be able to look back in your life and say, God did this this year. God this, did this in this season. God did this when I was in the middle of that. This happened when I was going through. You should have some tangible things around you to remind you that God worked a miracle. Now, I just, if you don't have any, just think about it. I mean, uh, it could start with your salvation experience. It could start with that thing that God said he was going to do. And when all odds were against you, right. God pulled it off. But you've got to have some memorials because the time is going to come where the enemy wants to discourage us from believing that God can do it again. I'm a witness he'll do it again and again and again and again. And again, and you don't have to wait till the midnight hour for God to turn it around. God can turn it around right now, but the memorials are the reminders that God has done it against all odds. Say with me, against all odds, God did it. Against what the people said, God did it. Against all the dreams and hopes that seems like they were flushing down the toilet, God still did it. So you got to set up a memorial, and what they did, they chose out 12 stones and they set it there as they were crossing over the Jordan to remind them that God crossed us over on dry land. I hope that you are this holiday season celebrating some crossing overs. I moved on to a new place. I, I, I let go of some old stuff. All right, say with me again, build a memorial. Mm -hmm. Now along with that, in Joshua chapter 5, and this, this one's going to sting a little bit, you've got to be willing to have a new circumcision. Uh-oh. I hear the sister say, that don't apply nothing to me. <laughs> that, that doesn't. And, and if you look in Joshua chapter 5, just, just for a few here, and, I, and I'll get it here. Uh, I want you to actually start at verse 2, please, sir. All right. Come on, sir. And I need some water, please, if we can get a minute. Joshua 5 and 2. Uh-huh. At that time, the Lord said unto Joshua, Make thee sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. Uh-oh. And Joshua made him sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the heel of the foreskins. And this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise. Mm -hmm. All the people that came out of Egypt that were males, even all the men of war, died in the wilderness, by the way, That's right. after they came out of Egypt. That's right. Now, all the people that came out were, sec were circumcised, but all the people that were born in the wilderness, by the way, as they came forth out of Egypt, them, they had not circumcised. That's right. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness. That's right. Till all the people that were men of war, which right. came out of Egypt, were consumed. Because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord, yeah. unto whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land which the Lord swore unto their fathers, that he would give us a land that floweth with milk and honey. Yes. And their children, whom he raised up in their stead, them Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised because they had not circumcised them by the way. Yes. One and it more. came to pass when they had done circumcised all the people that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. Listen, listen till, until they were whole. Now, why are we talking about circumcision? If you look around the room, this room is full of mostly women. Right? So, circumcision in the Old Testament was an act of covenant relationship between God and the children of Israel. But Paul helps us understand that true circumcision has nothing to do with the flesh. 
Oh boy, y'all not, not working with me. In Romans 2.25 said, For verily, for circumcision verily profited, if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfilleth the law, judge thee, who, is, who by the letter and circumcision doth transgress the law? 28. For he is a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not of the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. So he's talking about the cutting away of something in our heart. Sure. Okay, let's talk about the memorial just for a second. I moved to this place. I recognize that I'm crossing over. I am physically crossing over, but all of my emotions are not intact with me crossing over. I still have some feelings and concerns about what I just left. Right. Though I have physically moved, in my heart I'm still attached. So circumcision says that in this new place that I'm now occupying, I've got to cut away some things or allow God to deal with me about some stuff that I'm still holding in my heart so that I don't keep moving forward and still acting like my old nature. Right? It said, and they kept the circumcision until they got whole. I didn't say healed. I got to get over that stuff. Huh? I'm talking, to, I'm talking about wholeness. You say, well, well I, I, I forgave them and move on, but you're still mad and bitter because we're not whole. <laughs> Y'all not feeling me yet. Let's, let's define what wholeness really is. Jesus drops down on a pool called Bethesda. And the Bible said it had five porches and they're all kind of lame, halt, withered, impotent folk laying around the pool. He rose up on a, on a 38 year old condition. And he asked the man, he said, do you want to be made whole? Note he didn't say heal, he said whole. And what was the man's response? He went down through this story about a certain season where an angel would come down and trouble the water. And while he was trying to get down to the water, someone would jump in there first. And Jesus said, I didn't ask you about all that dialogue. I want to know if you want to be made whole. Of course the answer was yes. But the answer was a very unusual response. Pick up what you've been laying in and learn how to walk with it. <laughs> That's wholeness? Yeah. Pick up your bed and walk. We've got to learn how to stop suppressing and hiding all the ugly stuff. We got to learn how to walk with it. And if we walk with it, we'll get whole. Wholeness is when we can tell everybody about it, still hold in our consciousness the memory of it, but now it's a ministry instrument to win others to Christ. See, if you can't tell it, maybe you're not through with it. Maybe you're not over it. Well, I don't, I don't want folk to know all my business, but they know all your business anyway. Trust me, it's on Facebook. It, it, it's out there. So they stayed in the camp until they got home. See, we should be praying, God, I just don't want to get through this. I want to be whole with it. I want to be able to talk about it without getting mad. I want to be able to share my testimony without getting upset and want to do somebody some physical harm. That's wholeness. So in these new places in the land, we understand that we cannot infect people in our sphere of influence with our ugly, unresolved issues. So in other, in other words, instead of helping people out of their predicament, we tell them, oh, let me tell you how bad this was in my life. No, don't believe that. Oh, let me tell you, this is just going to be terrible. Look, you ain't going to make it, but I just hold on and just hope so. That's not faith. 
it's all right to tell people that you struggle, but also tell them about your victory. And this is what God did. And after I got over myself, this is what God said. All right, tell you, you got to get whole, baby. Got to get whole. You ready? Am I doing good? Joshua chapter 5. Here, here's the next big one. You know, as we're journeying along the way to our destination, to the place of our fulfillment or the place of our promise, God does so many supernatural things along the way. Supernatural provision. How he encourages us. Send a word. A bird drops down on your windshield with a message in its mouth saying, keep walking. You know? All those wonderful, you know, you know, wonderful fleece things that God does, the, you know, the fuzzy wuzzies that God says, I'm with you, I'm with you, child. Come on, get up. I'm going to change your diaper, change your poo poo. Come on, let's move. Right? And he does those things. Until we get in the land. The Bible says in Joshua 5, the man has ceased. And the children of Israel had to learn how to eat of the fruit of the land. See, it's not that God can't do supernatural things. He's waiting for us to do some work now. And things are just not going to come easy to you and I just because we're in the right place. We got to work. And guess what? If you don't work, you're not going to eat. <laughs> you didn't want to hear it that way. The manna ceased, and they had to eat of the fruit of the land. Now you say, well, 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 well that's okay, because I'm living in somebody else's house. I'm drinking out of somebody else's well. I'm eating off of somebody else's vine and all those wonderful things, so it should be plenty. Well, what you call plenty is going to run out. Right, right. And you're going to have to learn how to maneuver, how to occupy in the land. Okay? So the manna, that supernatural thing that God was raining out of heaven, it's going to stop. Are you saying God is going to stop doing miracles? No, but he's about to show you a new miracle. <laughs> it's going to be a new, a new miracle. And guess what? You're on the team. Well, I, I just want God to keep doing it. Well, if he keeps doing it the way he's doing it, it didn't cost you anything. All you had to do was go out and gather a little manna. Now you're going to have to work. What, 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 what kind of work might he ask me to do? <laughs> ah. Search for some fruit. You ready? Well, what do you mean by that? Well, you heard me talk last week that uh, I think uh, our daughter Rita read it this morning out of Numbers chapter 13. Moses commissioned 12 spies to go into the land, right? And the Bible says that when they got into the land, I call that the topographical map that God asked them to do. Search the land, look at the, look at the ravines, look at the hills, look at the cities, what kind of walls they got, what are the people like, and all this other stuff. And they come back, the scripture said, from a place called Eskol, and they have this huge cluster of grapes, right? And it's so big, it's so massive, they have to put it on a pole to carry it. Huh? Now, let me just kind of disarm us from some stupid thinking. You ready? For them to promote you, and make you the assistant, the assistant CEO, pay you a seven-figure salary is not the fruit of the land. Huh? They give you perks, private jet, two personal secretaries, meals on wheels, <laughs> an expense account. Everything that you need, they give you an expense account to buy your clothes, change your wardrobe, because they want you to look good because you are a representation of them. And you think, I have made it. That is not the fruit of the land. You make it when you win one of them to Christ. Because <laughs> the fruit of the land is not the stuff. 
The fruit that God is after are souls. And if you're not winning souls in your place, you are not being a good priest. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, let, let's, let's keep looking at this. See, the, the, the cluster of grapes on a staff was a spiritual symbol of, of a people that represented a new wine. And somebody has to bear these people until they get to maturity. What? Right? So remember out of Exodus chapter 23, God said, when you come into the land, he said, I'm not going to run all the inhabitants out of the land. Huh? And we cannot Judaize all those people in the land in a couple of weeks. Come on. We're not there yet. Right? So it's going to take some time to walk with these individuals to help them understand what your calling is in the land. And some are not going to respond to it quickly. All right? But the Bible says, uh, Elder Tom, if you would get for me Isaiah uh, 65 and verse 8. Mm hmm. Please, sir. Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servants' sake, that I may not destroy them all. Thank you. So new wine is found in the cluster, right? So they physically went into the promised land looking for fruit of the land. Then later on, spies were actually sent into the land, and guess where they found the cluster? In Rahab's condominium. Huh? Now, now if we follow the spiritual language, Rahab's condo, or uh, should we say frequent stay hotel or extended stay hotel, whatever you want to say, right? Symbolized new wine or refreshing or a cluster. Now, the reason why it's hard for us to accept that is the conditioning and the experience and the lifestyle we know Rahab was conducting, right? But if, if you're just going to be a surface individual, all of us are going to be disqualified because what you see of us don't look like new wine, not too much. <laughs> Y'all not feeling me. All right? So, so you, you have to be patient when individuals are in the land because they may not be able to, to, to discern the real treasure in the real flow on the inside of them, and that's why we gotta walk with them, right? right? right. Now, you can go in and set your third ear on the desk and say there's a new sheriff in town and blew everybody up, <laughs> right? Yeah. Or you can understand there's some valuable treasure in this field, and I have to patiently walk with him, which means I don't put up all my Jesus paraphernalia, I don't go around quoting the scripture all day long. I'm not trying to act spiritual. I'm not in the back room, pick up, pick up, pick up, pick up, you know, to make somebody think I've got authority. I just walk among them. And as God give me opportunity, I share when I discern that there is a need. And that may take a while. They may not know. I don't go in with all my Jesus, Jesus badges on. You say, well, are you denying God? I'm not denying him. I'm not just trying to sprinkle all my clothes with Jesus stuff. That's not making me spiritual. Right? As if to say, if I don't tell everybody immediately, I'm a Jesus-toting Bible preaching. If I don't tell them immediately, I have denied the faith. Well, Ezekiel said, maybe we just need to sit where they sit for a while. Well, I can't eat lunch with the heathen. Well, you eat lunch with you. 
Huh? I, I, I can't socialize folk like that. I can't do that. It's, a, it's amazing. Somebody said to us just this week, it's amazing what we do out in public when we think folk don't see it, but when we come to our immediate surrounding, oh, we do everything. Y'all get quiet on me. Huh? Well, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if I can go down to the cafeteria in the lunchroom with them. Matter of fact, I mean, the, the people in the workforce, they're talking about going over to the bar. I don't know if I can go over to the bar. You got one in your house? What you talking about? <laughs> I, 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 I'm just saying, all the excuses we peddle to disconnect ourselves from the fruit of the land. You say, well, you don't have to do what they do. You don't have to go to everywhere that they go, but, but they need what I have. And, and if I keep hiding myself in the dark, how are they gonna know what the light is? I thought that was a good word. Right? So it's not the goods of the land, but the people that we must carry on these poles. They carry the grapes on a staff. We've got to learn how to carry people. And it could be as simple as, I'm sorry you're going through that. I remember you in prayer. Huh? Hey, yeah, I, I, I'm available. I, I just want to reach out. Just slow yourself down and say, you know what? Can I pray for you? Can I, can I talk to you? I got a few moments here I can, I can share. Well, why is that critical? Look at James, if you would. James chapter 5. Are y'all with me? James 5. Uh, start at verse 13 for me, sir. Is there any, is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing songs. I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Verse 7. James, yep. James 5, 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and have long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. So the husbandman patiently waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and have long patience for it. How long has the father been waiting for a return on his investment? How, how long? How long? How long you think God's been waiting on you and I to just stand up? Can, can anybody deny that God has been patient, long suffering, gracious, merciful, and you've received that in your spirit? You know it's a truth. Well, why can't you give me a couple of days? A, a couple of days. Give me, give me, give me, give me a season to get there. So why are we so short-tempered with everybody around us, knowing that God has looked over our craziness for decades? Hasn't He done that? You know, and I and I, I understand seasons that folk just get on your absolute one and a half nerves. Right? Just just and they wear that one out. All right, and then you might say a few things, throw a through a few things, break a few, but then you come to yourself and say, What am I doing? This was just me last week. Right? So we need to give the individuals around us in the land time. You ready? This is going to help. I'm going to roll back to Joshua chapter 2 because this, this, is, this is important. The foundation of the spy's journey. Right? So we know they're going into Jericho. We know they're going to land in, in a, 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 I'm, I'm going to think of a wonderful name for Rahab so we can kind of connect to her. Her wonderful name for her and her brothel. Huh? I tell you, internet, social media, Facebook, they have nothing on Rahab. She knows everything, everybody, every new thing coming to town. Even the king 
comes to find out who's been through the city. That's powerful. I, can, I just can't get over that. Right? right. I, I mean, to me, that's mm -hmm. just classic. And this woman, with all of her skills, is going to find her way into the lineage of Jesus Christ. See, I like that. That's just fat all day long. Right? Okay. Joshua 2, verse 1. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly. Don't be afraid to say the word. You ain't cussing. Say it again. <laughs> Shittim. Shittim. <laughs> two men folk, to folk, spy. Hold on. Hold on. Folk get so uptight. Let's just tarry around the word. Shittim. <laughs> That's right. Folk need to laugh in church sometimes. <laughs> It's in the Bible. Yeah, it's in the Bible. Sure. Then they want to talk about Balaam's donkey. The scripture said ass. Everybody wants to say it. <laughs> Shit him. Say it with me. Shit him. <laughs> we we got to say that. It's too close. Right. Let me roll the tape back on your way to church this morning. <laughs> said, why are you messing with us? Because we need to laugh more. It's in the scripture. Isn't that all right? Yeah, shit him. Just well, shit him, shit him. <laughs> yeah, celebrate it, celebrate it. Oh, he's gone too far. He's gone too far. Just because you took Tim off the end of it, why are you, why are you hating on me? Y'all get it in a minute. Huh? Thank you. Thank you. So they journeyed from Shittim into Jericho. Right. Now, now, why is that important? Because the valley of Shittim represented a memorial that God wanted the children of Israel to be consciously aware of before they went into the promised land. Y'all with me? Yeah. See, the valley of Shittim contains acacia trees or shittim wood, and that wood was used to furnish all the furniture in the tabernacle. Y'all yeah. feel me? Yeah. So when you look at the description of shittim wood or acacia wood, again, we're talking about all the furniture in the tabernacle, and if you look at the dimensions of all the furniture in the tabernacle, it was very small because these trees did not grow very tall. Matter of fact, the taller they got, the more they bowed over. So let's talk about this. The higher you think you are, the real bowed over you become. You're not as straight as you think you are. The wood was knotty. It was, it was gnarly. I mean, it wasn't beautiful to behold. And some of it was very thorny. So the fact that God could take something ugly and gnarly and thorny and bowed it over and make something beautiful of it, put it in his tabernacle and say, I'm going to fill it with glory, speaks to what God can do with you and I in our rare form. So Joshua was saying, look, I don't want you going into this new place without a conscious recognition of what you are yourself. Because you know what? If you know what you are, you're going to look at the other people differently. Y'all not, not feeling that. Well, why, why do I need to know that? Well, <laughs> it's called compassion. Right? If you know your substance, if you know your origin, I believe that that was the key why they didn't pronounce judgment on Rahab. Huh? Y'all feel me? You, 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 you ever just, just saw someone and said, man, that's, that's a bad, ugly situation. I don't know how folk could get themselves into that, and then you check yourself. Just did that last week myself. <laughs> huh? You ever done a self-check and said, mm, guilty myself, Lord have mercy. Let me, let me, let me, let me you, 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 you. then you start to come, I've done this myself. Still doing it. Let me see if we can help one another. Change your conversation. Got me? Okay, I got, I got one more critical piece, 2 Kings chapter 17. 
And this is the call to teach. I'm in the land. I'm in the place. I recognize that there's some fruit in this land. How then do I share my testimony? Do I call a prayer meeting before work every morning? You could. I mean, I mean, if if if, if, if that's what you want to do, share, share, call a prayer meeting. Huh? I'll get my own special line. People can dial in while I'm at work, and no, don't do it. Don't do it while you work. They're paying you to work for them. Yes. Don't do it. That's not a good thing. Right. How 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 am I going how am I going to do this? Hmm? How am I going to let them know I rule? <laughs> you ready? Play tail. Yeah, play being the tail. <laughs> Why should I do that? Because you've got to learn how to serve. People are not going to respond to you just because you wear your little Superman cape. <laughs> serve. Find opportunities to do good, to, to serve. Second Kings chapter 17 tells a story about an Assyrian king who decided to place some other individuals in the land previously occupied by the children of Israel. Are we got it? Let's start at verse 24, please. And the king of Assyria mm -hmm. brought men from Babylon and from Kutha, and from Abba, and from You're Hamma, really doing good with those words. And from Seth Aphra. Just say shit up, go on. <laughs> and placed them in the cities <laughs> of Samaria mm -hmm. instead of all the children of Israel. And they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. And so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they feared not the Lord. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them right. and slew some of them. Right. Wherefore they spake to the king of Assyria, saying, uh -huh. The nations which thou hast removed uh -huh. and placed in the cities of Samaria know not the manner of the God of the land. Say it, say it. Therefore, hold on. So God has a conduit in the land called you and I. Everything good flowing in and out of the land is connected to you and my relationship to God. When they remove us, the gatekeeper, the door is open for anything else to come in and destroy the land. That's why I said, you got to get a sense of your own self-worth and valuable. God has connected you to a territory, not just because you're good at the job, but you're good at the gate. <laughs> Say with me, I'm just good at the gate. The gate needs me. The gate needs me. I am the portal. I am the instrument through which God wants to flow in and out. So for them to treat you bad, look, you don't have to necessarily write a grievance report. Tell God. Right. Y'all don't believe that, right? Don't you think God will get your enemies? Don't you think that God will do another review of your situation and say, I know what y'all wrote, but let me tell you what I'm going to do. Huh? And HR is busy trying to fix all the stuff they said about you. They're erasing things off of your documents that somebody else said. Y'all yeah. not feeling me. Y'all yeah, not feeling me. Look, if probate court can erase some stuff off an official file, I know HR could take some stuff off of your stuff. Huh? Make them write it. Make them, make them write the wrong. Don't you know God, God's got that kind of power? You know, if God can take an invisible hand and write his hand on the wall and say, meeny, meeny, T. Kelly, Farson, I've waved this thing in the balance, don't you think God can say, look, I have waved this thing on the balance and show out an HR, and all of a sudden they flipping your whole script and paying you. <laughs> Y'all don't believe that yet. All right. So, 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 so there, God is just as involved in the place of your maturity as you are. That's the place where you all are making covenant. And what happened? They know not the manner of the God of the land. Therefore he sent what? Therefore he sent 
lions among them, among them and behold because they knew not the man of the god of the land all right then they the king of assyria commanded saying carry thither one of the priests whom you brought from thence wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute you know this department wow. has not run sufficiently <laughs> since we moved you everybody's upset nobody's getting along it is unproductive and will you go back and get Mary Lou and ask Mary Lou if she'll come back to this department with an increase in her salary I know she may be making more over here but we need whatever she was doing in here to make this thing go because this piece is critical to the whole thing you said, well, that, that, that's, a, that's a demotion. Well, the souls you're about to win is a promotion. Y'all yeah. yeah. don't feel me yet. The Bible says there was an old, a young, whatever, middle-aged woman in the scriptures. And all she had was some sewing skills. I imagine it. She was not like Lydia. She wasn't a seller of purple, but she probably had some pieces of threads and rags and stuff. And the Bible says that she took those pieces and she made coats for the widows. Huh? Now I'm going to say it just wasn't a coat, but everything she made carried her mantle. Y'all not feeling me yet? See, I'm telling you, you saturate the atmosphere with the glory that's hidden on the inside of you. And the Bible says that Dorca, Tabitha died. And all these widows came to Peter showing them, she made this for me, she made this for me. And he was so moved, y'all not feeling it. He raised her from the dead because her assignment was not finished. I'm telling you, when you get into the place of your assignment, there is supernatural assistance that's assigned to you to make sure that you accomplish what God has told you to do. You say, well, I'm going to die here. Then die. We'll just raise you up. Y'all not feeling me yet. See, the land responds. See, they'll do something like this. You know what? Stuff just started growing when you came around. Things started working. Things started flipping. The atmosphere, everybody started smiling when you came. That's the grace of God when you hit your place. Okay. All right. Is our time short? I'm almost out. Can I, can I, can I close this out? Keep going. Keep going. Joshua chapter 5. This is the hard one. All right. So let's say all of your life, like you and I, you've been waiting for this moment. Huh? They finally called my name. Huh? You've been waiting for this moment, right? You know you're going into the promised land. You know there's going to be some strategy. You know there's going to be some, some struggle. You know there's going to be some battles. So you, 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 you're willing to embrace all that, Joshua. I got you that. Then all of a sudden, a big old angel show up and say, hey, we ain't going to do it this way at all. Oh, no. There are new plans that you know not of in the place of your inheritance. There are some things working on your behalf that, that God is, God would be foolish to get you there than say, I now want you to rely on your strength to make the rest of this happen. So be prepared that God is going to change what you think. He's trying to change how you, how you plan this is going to end. It's not going to end like you think. It's not going to work out like you've got it in your mind. I've been dreaming about this day, dreaming about this. It was a daydream. It ain't a real one. Hmm. Huh? I, 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 I can just see it happen. Like this. One, two, three. And God said, I'm doing none of your stuff. I don't need any of your stuff. I, I want to show the people in the land that I am for you. Therefore, I'm going to do a supernatural thing so that they know that you call upon the name of the Lord. So what do you want me to do, Joshua? This is what I want you to do. See. 
(laughs) See what? How I can take every physical thing standing in your way and pull it down by praise. Everything you call an obstacle, when you learn how to say Jesus right, it's coming down. Everything that's a struggle, when you learn how to praise the name of the Lord, it's got to come down. Everything you think is in your way and locked up, every time I put you in a praise position, stuff comes down. That's what I want you to see. That all the time you were going through, I was working on a weapon on the inside of you called hallelujah. When you say hallelujah, the angels say, yeah, get it. <laughs> Praise pulled down that obstacle. Huh? See, the warfare that we do, well, I'm, I'm so sick of these knuckleheads around me, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. You only got a couple of pieces left. You better hold on to it. <laughs> See, what we do in secret in our prayer closet, God rewards us openly. Huh? Go behind that door, wherever it is, and I'm not talking about run to the bathroom, lock yourself in it for three hours and call it a break. That, that's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about within yourself right immediately. I know I'm in direct contact and fellowship with the almighty God. I have shut the door to all obstacles and all the voices telling me that God is not going to do it. And I say right now, there's a hallelujah welling up on the inside of me. And I know that my God moves obstacles. He's never failed me yet. And God, I'm looking for you to do all of a sudden. You step out of your closet and what you thought was still standing there is not there any longer. That's the God we serve. See, we've learned that along the way. I've got this memorial back here that says, you know, last time you praised God like that, you know what happened. Huh? And the time before that, you, you praised God and dismissed everything. And you know what? And the time before that, last time you got really serious, you ran around the church like a crazy person. You, you got all these witnesses behind you to say, when you cry, when the righteous cry, the Lord hears and delivers. I know that about my God. <laughs> tell you, David, there's a new sheriff in town. <laughs> you tell him, and I'm packing. <laughs> don't, don't tell him, don't make, don't make me praise him. <laughs> don't, don't, don't make me call upon his name. Don't make me do the Shabbat. Don't, don't, don't make me clap my hands. <laughs> <laughs> Tell him I am armed. I am armed and dangerous. Don't, don't, don't make me go to my closet. Come on, on your feet. We're on our way. Yeah, new sheriffs in town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hallelujah. Huh. Father, all this time, some of us has, has thought that deliverance is something we need to do. <laughs> and it is, but it's just so simple. It's just to praise you. It's just to build the altar. It's just to magnify you. It's to defy what people think and what people feel. And even if they question, say, what, what are they doing? I took a praise break. I had to have a a one-on-one immediate consultation with the God of my salvation. And see, and even if the manifestation is delayed, the Bible says he rewards us with a peace that passeth all understanding. (laughs) I got peace about this. Everybody asks, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? I said, I got a piece about this. Well, well, how's it going to happen? I don't know how it's going to happen, but I know who's going to do it. That's why I got a piece about this thing. Hmm. Well, why are you so sure? Because I've been here before. 
And before that. And before that. And before that. And he's never failed me. Yeah. So, Father, for those that are gathered in this room, in this place, we accept the assignment and we know our responsibility. You have placed us and strategically set us wherever we are to be the priest to teach the people the manner of the God of the land. So God, help us to be aware of who's around us. Help us to be sensitive and compassionate to their needs. And God, may our light so shine before men that as they're looking upon the good work, they glorify you that is in heaven. God, help us to accept and believe and confess we are atmosphere changers. The world's a better place because of us. The neighborhood is a safer place because of us. Our workplace is a more peaceful place because of us. Glory. Hmm. So God, we worship you. We honor you. And we bless you. Bless your people with peace and rest as we leave out of this place. And help us to approach our day differently. Our day is now an opportunity for you to be glorified through us. Mm hmm. We are changers. We are movers. We are shakers. Hmm. Huh. We're the army of the Lord arising out of obscurity. We are the answer to the earth's cry that's groaning and travailing until now. Huh. We're the solution. We're the answer. Help us to say so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, saints of the Most High. Share something real quick. Uh, so, so